the America's economy is back and roaring and its people are winning. That is the title of President Trump's new op-ed this morning in USA Today newspaper. He is touting the sweeping Republican tax cuts. In it, the president writes this, this is the last year Americans will fill out outdated, complicated tax forms in the years ahead because I signed one of the largest tax cuts in history and the most sweeping tax reform in a generation. Many Americans will complete their taxes on a simple single sheet of paper. America's competitive edge has also been restored. We know that when American workers compete on a level playing field, American workers win. This is coming as a new NBC Wall Street Journal poll, meanwhile, finds that limited support is out there for the tax cuts. Only 27 percent of voters say that they think the Republican tax law is a good idea. Joining me right now is Republican Texas Congressman and House Financial Services Committee Chairman Jeb Henserling. Mr. Chairman, good to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Is that messaging? What is that? Why do you think that, that so many people, are, this tax plan is not resonating with them? Well, I think it will as time goes by. And again, 90, over 90 percent of all Americans are going to see greater take-home pay. I mean, when people start looking at their checks, they're going to see a difference. And I can tell you in my neck of the woods in Dallas, Texas, be it American Airlines or Southwest Airlines, uh, Comerica, AT&T, people are getting $1,000 bonuses. They're getting increases in their 401ks. Even the rural part of my congressional district in kind of rural East Texas, I'm getting people right in and saying, hey, uh, at my husband's work, everybody just got a 5% uh, pay increase. So uh, this is going to bubble out, uh, up all over uh, America. And uh, one, it is really good policy. Uh, we're seeing strong GDP growth. We're seeing the lowest unemployment rate in right. 17 years. And so typically good policy will end up being good politics. And I think by the time November rolls around, most people are going to see, wow, this tax plan really worked. It worked for me. It's working for the country. Congressman, let me ask you about the president revealing his latest picks to fill these uh, Federal Reserve board seats. Uh, he, he's naming uh, two new to these board seats. Your thoughts on, on what they bring to the table and the president's nominations yesterday? Well, I just saw them, and I'm not all that familiar with the individuals, but uh, as long as they're of the caliber of his previous picks, uh, I am uh, encouraged. Um, and so there's a lot that uh, needs to be done. And as you know, we're going to meet with Vice Chairman Quarles. We have a hearing here at 10 a.m. First time we will ever have a Vice Chairman for Supervision appear before us uh, because the previous president, Barack Obama, refused to appoint one. So now we have one, and I'm, I'm, I'm excited uh, to have him here because even though most people know the Fed for monetary policy, they are the uber prudential regulator in our financial system. Yeah. And, and Randy Quarles is very very, very important. I'm encouraged by some of the speeches he's had to talk about uh, transparency, to talk about efficiency and simplicity in kind of the exam process uh, and um, in the application of rules. So we're going to do a lot of, uh, of exploring of that this morning. Well, there, well, uh, this is very important, obviously, for the financial services industry in particular. What do you want to see from Randy Carls in, in terms of rulemaking and how things may change for the financial services industry? What kind of rule changes would you like to see? Well, number one, I think the Fed has way too much discretionary power uh, as a prudential regulator. Let's separate that again from their monetary policy function. But if they're going to have this discretionary power, let's at least see where they can use it for the good. Number one, the Volcker rule, which I believe is, is still a solution in search of a problem. Having said that, we have five, and some banks have five different regulators to both interpret the Volcker rule and to uh, enforce the Volcker rule. I mean, it's just just crazy. This is just nonsense. And I want to know what the Fed can do to try to get all the regulators on the same page so at least you have one rule, preferably, and as we have passed recently in the House as of last Thursday, a bill that would say, you know what, we're going to have one prime uh, regulator for the interpretation of Volcker, one prime regulator for the enforcement of Volcker. Uh, the stress test in living wills, the living wills are now an annual process, very cumbersome, very expensive. I think they're probably antiquated as soon as the ink is dry. Uh, I want to explore taking that uh, to uh, an every other year exercise. Uh, stress test. So we've got CCAR, we've got DFAST. But banks are stress testing their assets every single day and every single week, and the Fed has access to this information. Right. You know, why do they have to necessarily impose these other 
test, and why do they have to be secretive? Mm. You know, the rule of law counts on knowing what the law is, yeah. and instead, they are tested on scenarios that they never know about. They don't get any feedback. Again, it's one of the most cumbersome aspects, and the bottom line is, in some respects, this is still a, a, a bit of a tax on capital, right. the regulatory burden. And thanks to President Trump and a Republican Congress, we now have a 3% right. growth this is, tax this is code. The reason the president rolled back regs, Dagan. Right, and I'm curious what the congressman has to say about this newfound fiscal discipline that we're hearing from the Democrats. They're all <laughs> so concerned now about the national debt and the deficits, even all of those Democrat uh, advisors to past presidents writing that op-ed last week saying, oh, it's not entitlements, it's the tax cuts that are running up the debt. Why isn't there more pushback from the Republicans on this? Because it, it's laughable at some of the messaging on this. Well, it is laughable. We've heard nothing but crickets uh, from the uh, Democrats any time we tried to deal with this great peril. And, and, and listen, this is the uh, mo most foreseeable crisis uh, in America's history. It, it's like a slow-moving tsunami coming offshore. And the Democrats have said, you know, there's no tomorrow. So now we try to give tax relief to working Americans so that they can realize their American dream. And then all of a sudden, oh, my God, we care about the deficit. Well, number one, if you look at uh, the Reagan tax relief, the Kennedy tax relief, you can even go back to the Coolidge tax relief. We lowered tax rates, we got more tax revenue. And as long as this tax plan can help incent, I believe it's 2.85 yeah. GDP growth, it will quote unquote pay for itself so, if you believe that tax relief needs to pay for itself. We get more revenues coming in. I mean, that's not theory, that's data. So did, so did you vote yes for the omnibus bill, Congressman? You know, I did for the same reason the president did, and that is we paid a ransom uh, to get money for our troops, our soldiers, sailors, and airmen. I didn't want to do it, but I reluctantly supported it for the same reason the president did, and for the same reason I'm calling for a rescission package. Yeah. You know, so, it takes but do you 60 want the, do votes. You want to rescind some of this, the, some of that spending? No, I don't rescind. I want to rescind, rescind almost all of it, you know. Yeah. I, I want to pay for the military, and outside of that, there's not a whole lot more that I'm all that interested right, in. Sure. I exaggerate slightly to make the point. Point, but we are a nation that's on the road uh, to, to bankruptcy. So I mean, there's no yes. doubt about it. Stop voting yes to the spending bills, then, Congressman. How about well, that? Well, I got, I got Let it. Let the government well. shut down, then, if that's what you have to do. People are ripping mad about that omnibus bill. You know that. Oh, I know that. I know that. And again, we should not have paid this ransom. Had yeah. I been in charge, which I wasn't, I make suggestions, we should have run the, the uh, uh, Pentagon, the military appropriations bill over to the Senate. And if they voted it down once, twice, five times, ten times, so be it. At some point, they would have broken. Yep. We, we won the last uh, contest over the shutdown. Well, we could have won blinked. this somebody one. Somebody blinked, and that's where we are now. Congressman, it's good to see you, sir. Thank you very much. Th we'll be watching that you. hearing today. Uh, Randy Quarles, we appreciate you joining us this morning. Congressman Jeb Henserling.